it's just amazing to see so many people here interested in this uh, presentation and this report, which is called Creating the New Economy, uh, Business Models, Putting People and Planet First. I'm Bob Doherty, and I'm the Chair of AgriFood in the University of York in the north of England. But this presentation is a result of 16 months of research with an amazing collaboration between academia and the World Fair Trade Organization, which is represented today by uh, Dr. Erin uh, Sahan, who's the Chief Executive, who's doing a live Facebook uh, at this moment in time, and uh, Dr. Helen Ho from Cambridge University in the United Kingdom from Judge Business School, who's also here, and Tom Wills as well from uh, Tradecraft Exchange, and Dr. Simon Croft from Stockholm Environmental Institute in the University of York in the UK. So we've been working together uh, for 16 months on this uh, study and we've been looking kind of at a unique population. You know what academics are like. We like to look at uh, interesting phenomena and we think this, the World Fair Trade Organization membership, which is also made up of all the 400 organizations, 376 of them are hybrid enterprises and some of them are also member, you know, certified by Fairtrade International as well. But they are unique. They're unique because their mission is social or environmental. But they trade to achieve that social and environmental mission. And they often are called uh, social enterprises. They increasingly are referred to hybrids because they're neither uh, private sector they're neither non-profit and they're neither public sector. They actually inherit characteristics from two or all of those sectors and they kind of occupy the intersections of those three different parts of the economy. So as academics, we are, we are actually quite, uh, you know, we're interested in this phenomena, these, this population of hybrids. I'll say more about that later. And what's also interesting, our research has been in three phases. So first of all, we interrogated, in a quantitative way, we interrogated the uh, annual member survey of the World Fair Trade Organization. Uh, and we looked at aspects of governance, aspects of uh, use of profit, social mission, and it uncovered some interesting themes that myself and Helen and Simon wanted to delve into further. And so what we did, we did a tailor-made survey based around these key themes, and that went also out to all the key members of the, uh, all the membership of the World Fair Trade Organization. And that threw up some other interesting aspects, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And then we uh, went upon a journey, and it was, it was a journey, of delving into case studies. So we actually constructed 19 case studies of organizations all over the world, looking at doing interviews, uh, looking at their social impact reports, uh, looking at newspaper articles, various other things, and developed these uh, 19 cases. So a very rigorous, robust uh, piece, of, uh, piece of work. Now, this population of hybrids, this, um, who, who, who have social mission as their primacy, is in stark contrast, really, to mainstream business. And I'm going to talk a little bit about mainstream business now, uh, in that what we find, and we study mainstream business models as well, we find this lock-in, and this lock-in is this kind of uh, preoccupation with maximizing shareholder return. And in fact, that maximization, that level of shareholder, shareholder return has continued to increase in the United Kingdom from 2014 to 2018. Shareholder returns actually went up 56%. And some of those organisations are actually making less profit than they were previously. So how does that work? And we also realise that we find ourselves in the Anthropocene, not by accident. You know, we see a lot of negative environmental and social consequences from some of the business practices that uh, we, we, we also uh, investigate. And it can't be business as usual. That is not sustainable. So as academics, we're always looking for uh, you know, new alternative business models that could work, uh, also work in the, in the mainstream as well. And it's no accident, actually, that there's a small meeting not far away from here uh, taking place called Davos. And their theme, their theme uh, is
is actually stakeholder capitalism. So they're also looking at how they can work in a, in a much better way uh, across the stakeholder, uh, you know, with NGOs, with community, uh, with government, uh, so on and so forth. And I think that's a positive. Uh, so I think our message to, to Davos is, you know, have a look at our report. And they're following us on Facebook. And they're following us on Facebook, so that's yeah. good. And, and uh, we, you know, we, want, we obviously would like a, a dialogue. And also, these scary statistics about the concentration of wealth that also can't come to you as well. So what did we find? I think that's what I want to focus on. In our research, what did we find unusual about the structural elements of these business models? And I want to share four key themes, but I also want to add another couple as well. The first thing is that 92% of these uh, hybrid enterprises reinvest their profit back into a variety of different uh, mechanisms. They pay bonuses to workers, to artisans, they uh, invest in health and education programs, they build uh, capacity, uh, they do counselling for people who've been disadvantaged, and that's really, really a kind of an example of how they reinvest their profits, their surplus, as they call it, into their social mission. Very fascinating that 52% of the members of the Welfare Trade Organisation are actually, the chief executives are actually female. And that's phenomenal. If you look at mainstream business, it's only 8% to draw a contrast. If you look at the boards of these organisations, the board makeup is 51% female. If you look at mainstream business, it's only 12%. So I think that's something to, to look at even further in greater depth, particularly if you think of Sustainable Development Goal 5, about gender equality. Also, the survivability of these enterprises is very impressive. Four times as more likely to survive than SME counterparts. Uh, we've looked at that data. And um, yeah, that, that's also, in terms of resilience, also very, very important as well. Fourthly, this is this crafting of the social and the commercial objectives that they 85% of the members of the World Fair Trade Organization also admitted, or, or were proud of it actually, to say that at certain points in their, in their lifespan as an enterprise, that they've sacrificed uh, commercial profit for social and environmental goals. So it's that balancing of you know, profits and uh, social, social mission. Two other, for me personally, two other elements I'd like to add, was in terms of governance, 34% of the members uh, have producers or artisans on the board. Also, there was a real sense of democracy in the investigation. Citizen, sort, sort of workers' assemblies, uh, producer committees, and that's really important in terms of building collaboration and building stakeholder uh, buy-in as well. And I think the other, for me, the other element is that I, I go back to one of my case studies, which is Salah. Uh, handmade in the Philippines, it was set up in 1987 because of conflict. They set up in a conflict area to give young people a, 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 a different opportunity of getting involved in conflict. And I think a lot of these organisations set up where the private sector doesn't want to go. They set up in, in, in times of natural disaster like earthquakes in Nepal. They set up in conflict zones and they really, really do build capacity and help communities recover from uh, previous uh, disasters. I better speed up. So a few uh, highlights of some of the case studies that we looked at. Manas del Uruguay uh, produces high, high um, value fashion, uh, designs and textiles for some major brands. Uh, and they've been set up here, as you can see, since 1968, have a very, very resizable turnover. The board is made up of artisans, completely 100%. Uh, artisans and they have two retail shops in Montevideo so they're both exporting and also selling also to the local markets as well. Uh, very interesting if you look at the report there there's a more of a uh, expansive uh, case study in there. Now one of my favorite organizations is the Women's Skills Development Organization in Pokhara in Nepal and Women's Skills is led by a female called Ran Carly and this organisation has been going for several decades now. 
And all the, you go there, I went there in mid-December, and you go there, and on the wall is a, is a diagram of the board, it's all women. The management committee is all women, apart from one, one man who's the operations director. And they work with disadvantaged women. And they make really, really interesting, they use indigenous designs and textiles and weaving, using things like metal fiber, to make really, really high-end uh, product. Handbags, felt, puppets, all sorts of different things. And they have a really interesting retail outlet in Kathmandu and Papua called Woven. If you ever go to Kathmandu or go to Tamil, this Woven shop is really, really super. Uh, and, and targets local and Nepalese professionals and the middle classes, but also targets tourists as well. There's a really, really good job of building capacity with 600 uh, disadvantaged women and also employs over 100 uh, women as well in the organisation. Gabana here in Switzerland, interesting organisation because it, it was emerged in the 1970s and it was one of the first organisations to unveil and un unpack the problems of female workers in the banana sector. Uh, and since then, it's then developed a very, very strong business. As you can see here, 31 million euros, looking at dried fruits, uh, commercialising fair trade dried fruits. And interestingly, it pays 10% of the retail price of its products back to the producers. So again, a real profit with, uh, with purpose model uh, there as well. So fair trade enterprises, these members of the World Fair Trade Organization, are different. I mean, it's very important that to, to, to look at them and how they structure the governance and their reinvestment of profit. They prioritize people, uh, whereas some, some other uh, corporations don't. And as I've already said, they go to places where others won't go. They go to conflict areas, areas of disaster, and they set up enterprises that, that rebuild uh, communities and give people a, a opportunity. They're very much livelihoods focused. Another really interesting example is Womencraft in Tanzania. Womencraft is, is 600 uh, women involved in this organization who were refugees. They came from Burkina Faso, Rwanda, and the, and the DRC. And actually, with World Fair Trade Organization, in that particular region, they are the delivery agent for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And they do a great job in commercializing really interesting indigenous designs uh, in, in textiles, but also in, in baskets and, and other, uh, other handcrafts as well. Really amazing organization to, and again, featured in our report. This is a strong network globally, over 76 different countries involving all the way along the value chain from producers to retailers. That's very important to, to know. It's a kind of, it works, you know, it works, but increasingly, these organizations are finding markets in the mainstream as well. Women's skills development organization in Hokura, you know, the kind of outlets, and they're non fair trade outlets as well. So there's an appeal because of the quality of the, of the product. Increasing population and hybrids, that's a very important take home message from today. Uh, not only in fair trade, in other, in other sectors as well. Uh, businesses doing things differently. And some recommendations, just to finish off with uh, recommendations for business policy. And, and, and also for investors. I think there's an, there's an onus and a responsibility on, on the mainstream, you know, the, the profit maximizing model, to actually incorporate these companies and their supply chains. And some organizations are doing that uh, because of the, they can see the quality, they can see the impact. So they need to be able to accommodate their distinctive characteristics in terms of credit lines, in, in, in terms of economies of scale, and so on and so forth. And also, it will give corporates a way of learning about ethical practice in supply chains. And I think that's also important in terms, in terms, in terms of knowledge exchange. Require, we have a recommendation for investors. There's obviously a ecosystem growing the right social investment. And there are, in the case studies, a number of examples of where social investment really works. Uh, Organisations like Oiko Credit, Shared Interest, who are providing really, really good investigation capital at lower, lower rates of uh, uh, expected return, and it's really working well for some of these organisations. We would like to see that ecosystem growing, and, and that's one of our recommendations for investors. And for policymakers, a lot of policymakers here in this room, and um, you know, we'd like to see support for social finance.
the more social investment initiatives, uh, capacity building in that area, because it, it really, really is important for these organisations, particularly when they start up or when they're working through difficult periods. Support social enterprises, these hybrid organisations in, in, in missions, in exhibitions, because that's also valuable in terms of showcasing their products to the market, to, uh, to Europe and the US and, and beyond. And also, maybe if you're involved in public procurement practice, is to look at criteria, look at weighting towards, you know, uh, encouraging these kind of organisations to get involved in uh, public procurement at a European level, but at a global level as well. The full report, as you can see here, Join the Business Revolution, it's a very, very exciting moment, I think, that we're able to you know, share this news with you because these organisations work. They really re restructure elements on, uh, it's not charity, it's commercial sense, and I think that's the most important thing. It works commercially. And it, it's, uh, there are a number of lessons for sort of mainstream business to learn from this population of hybrids. Thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, we're working to stay behind at the end. We're very open to questions. And thank you very much for, for coming today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.